Sorry, self dare? Then come down to Richmond and delve with us into 2000 years of world heritage. Here you can find information on plant knowledge and its discovery using the library, art and archives of the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. Born in 1852 and still going strong the year 2020, the library, art and archives department has been providing readers, researchers, horticulturalists and the general public with the materials they need to answer the questions that drive them. The person you heard there was Arvid, the current library graduate trainee, and I'm Christina, and I'm the archives graduate trainee. Together we would like to introduce you to the wonderful and diverse collections we hold here at Kew. So let's begin. Kew Gardens were once Royal Kew, and later effectively became the botanical arm of government, which gives our collections an international scope. Together with a wealth of information on the history of science, our collections also provide fascinating insight into the cultural importance of plants. We also hold records reflecting the transition of Imperial Q to Partnership Q, the symbol of which is the Millennium Seed Bank in Wakehurst, which incidentally also has its own research library. Today, conservation dominates our international activities. Q's scientific vision is to document and understand global plant and fungal diversity and its uses. Library art and archives play a vital role in supporting the work of our scientists directly and record stores and disseminates their findings for the benefit of future generations. We start with the library. Beginning with a budget of only £10 per year, we have used the last 168 years to mass nearly half a million printed items on plants, their history and humanity's diverse and fascinating relationships with them. Consequently, we have books in more than 90 languages. Whilst their storage locations are not accessible to the public, the items certainly are, and any historian should start their work via our library catalogue. Here you will find details of most of the published items in our collection, Everything from our rare books to the newest works published just this year. We hold a copy of almost any ancient botanical work of note, many of which are originals. Physically, the oldest item we take care of is a manuscript copy of a herbal, Hortus sanitatus, which dates from about 1370. But we also have the text of the Elder Pliny, as well as material on the uses of plants in ancient Egypt. They are sharing shelves with early printed books, books in botany that were published before Linnaeus changed botany forever, and in Cunabula. We also have comprehensive published collections on ecology, the environment and climate change. Our dedicated economic botany section looks at the uses of plants and includes books and pamphlets on medicinal plants, crops, dye and fibre plants as well as plants used as building materials. There is also a wide variety of materials on ethnobotany, that is the use of plants by indigenous peoples. If you're looking for inspiration and to see what people in the past thought about the quote unquote new worlds they had discovered. Why not take a look at our shelves containing accounts of travels together with gazetteers and maps. Among them are riveting and fascinating first-hand accounts of exploration and plant hunting. We are particularly proud of the biographical collection on scientists, gardeners, explorers and botanists, both male and female, that accompany them. They are a great place to start your research. We also carry extensive journal runs in print and online. To complement our world-class botanical illustration collection, the library also collects literature about artists, art history, drawing and painting techniques, including material about modern artists and recent exhibitions. Combine this in your mind's eye with our shelves on botanical gardens, the histories of pleasure gardens and garden design and you will start to get a good sense of our library collection. Finally, add a dash of scientific works on plant chemistry, DNA sequencing and mycology, the study of fungi and you are sure to find something to assist your research. As you can see, there is a lot in half a million books, so if you have a story to tell about the impact of climate change on nature, plants and people, make Hughes Library a stop on your list of libraries to visit. Next, let us move on to the second collection administered by Hughes LAA department, the art collections. We hold over 200,000 individual artworks of plants expressed in a variety of media including paper, vellum, prints, pencil sketches, line drawings and oils. These also include portraits of Hughes staff and eminent botanists. Our art collection is unique in the fact that it was not brought together based on artistic merit, but rather scientific accuracy and value as a source of botanical information. Beautiful they are nonetheless, and that is what makes them special. We refer to them as plant portraits and they are expressions of a rare and difficult to achieve combination of skills. They bring together botanical knowledge and an outstanding attainment of artistic techniques. We collect these plant portraits because historically, and to this day, they are more resilient than the dried type specimens collected in Herbaria. The moment you collect a plant, it will start to change. Colors fade, the plant dries out and becomes brittle. Illustrations capture and freeze in time a vital full picture of the living plant, an invaluable resource in the age before high definition photography and a valuable tool to this day. 
Anyone who has ever grown a plant knows that in the wild, no two specimens look exactly the same. Illustrations, if done well, help you recognize the plant regardless, for an artist can standardize and clarify details, whereas a photograph can only ever record what is present in the moment it was taken. Historically, everything in this collection was assembled by botanists, and art, as a freestanding collection, has only existed for about 40 years. In the past, the works were kept together with dried plant specimens in the herbarium and were used there primarily as a tool to advance science. This makes our art collection a valuable source for the history of science, showing which characteristics of plants were important when. In recent years, we have moved about 20,000 of these artworks to temperature-controlled stores where they are kept as special collections. They are now regularly used to illustrate books, provide color for publications, and are researched as artifacts in their own right. But next, the big question. What could you use our art collection for? Tucked away in our collections is some of the finest botanical art ever produced. There are for example paintings of tulips by Dutch Golden Age artist and self-declared God of Flowers, Simon Verelst, who lived out his days in London painting for Charles II. You could also follow the footsteps of Pierre-Joseph Redouté, court painter to Marie Antoinette and both of Napoleon's wives. He lived through the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror, and never lost sight of his skills or contacts. Most famous for his work on roses, he actually studied botanical illustration here with us at Kew in 1787. Investigating his work means looking at the output of an artist at the top of his game during a golden age of botanical art. Redouté's work is available to view online in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. We are a proud founding member of the BHL and have so far contributed over 65,000 digitized pages to this repository, all of which you can access right now for free. We're digitizing more and more here at Q, and the art department is especially focused on creating digital copies of botanical art produced by women. For their work, while soft and silenced and overlooked, is especially well represented in our collections. To give you just a few names, there's for example Margaret Mean, who died in 1824. She spent her later life employed with an actual salary as a painter at Q, and her paintings are one of the backbones of our collection. Then there is Sibylla Merian whom David Attenborough considers one of the most significant contributors to the field of insect research. Sibylla and her daughters traveled to Suriname in 1699 on a self-funded exhibition to research insects, which she painted together with the plants they are intimately associated with. The exquisitely illustrated books she published are also in our collection. Next, there is Sarah Ann Drake, or Miss Drake as she is more widely known as, a personal favorite of our curator. Her detailed work is exquisite, but what makes her corpus really distinctive is that she would leave large parts of her work uncolored, giving the colorist just enough information to follow her example. She was the principal illustrator for John Lindley's Certum Orchidaceum, a stunning and important work on orchids that is now housed in our rare books collection. This interplay between art and illustrator monograph, how the pictures get into books before the advent of digital publication programs, is another field of research our collections can serve. Finally, we would like to mention the illustrations that came to us through Anne Lee. We are currently digitizing these works in partnership with the Oak Spring Gardening Foundation. What makes this set interesting is that together with works by Anne Lee herself, came a set of plant portraits by unnamed and to us, unknown Chinese artists. Anne's father James Lee was a nurseryman, and it seems likely that these paintings came together with seeds from China, to give an idea of what the full plant would look like once grown. There's a real research opportunity here to discover more about these paintings and the artists behind them. It is through these plant portraits we collect that you can advance our understanding of the role of otherwise silent voices in the production of knowledge. Next, we would like to introduce you to the wonderful world of LAA collection number three, the archives. We hold over 4,600 individual collections, comprising of a range of materials, including correspondence, maps, plans, notebooks, photographs, and records of plants received and sent out from Kew. The subjects covered in our collections range from botany, horticulture, science, and exploration, as well as the history of our gardens and its staff. There is much to explore in our archive, but for now, let us look at some of the highlights of our collection. We are lucky to have the personal papers of some of the greatest natural explorers of all time. One of our most significant collections is our Joseph Hooker papers. Joseph Hooker was a prolific scientist and botanist who went on to become the assistant director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in 1855 and later director after his father William Hooker between 1865 and 1885. The collection consists of papers and correspondence on every facet of Hooker's life, including the many expeditions that Joseph was a part of. Another great gem in our collections are the Marianne North papers. Marianne North was a biologist and botanical artist who travelled around the globe painting and drawing plants in their natural habitats. 
As a woman travelling alone during the latter half of the 19th century, you could say she was a woman ahead of her time, and the results of her passion to capture the world's flora can be seen in the Marianne North Gallery, situated within the gardens. The gallery holds 832 of her paintings, which she gifted to Kew, along with the building which she designed and had built to display them. The Marianne North papers contain correspondence written by Marianne to various friends and acquaintances, both about her travel experiences and the creation and development of her beloved gallery. One of the most treasured of our collections are our Charles Darwin papers. These comprise letters written by Darwin to John Henslow, Professor of Botany and Geology at the University of Cambridge and a very close friend and mentor to Darwin. The letters cover the period from 1831 to 1837, from when Darwin was negotiating his position on HMS Beagle to during his time on the voyage and for a short period after his return to England. You may not know this, but Darwin almost didn't go on the now famous Beagle voyage. Darwin's father objected to his son going on the trip, and Darwin did not want to go against his father's wishes. Thankfully, his father changed his mind in time, and shortly after that decision, Darwin began making arrangements to sail with Captain Fitzroy as naturalist on the voyage. However, it wasn't always smooth sailing for Darwin. He often suffered from seasickness and expressed as much in his letters to Henslow. Darwin's correspondence also contains observations and details of the specimens collected along his travels and the new people he met. They are a fascinating insight into the experiences which would lead Darwin to his theory of evolution by natural selection and the consequent fame he would receive from it. Equally valuable historically is the director's correspondence collection. This collection comprises scientific correspondence received by senior staff at Kew from 1841 to 1928, including correspondence from Kew's first official director, William Hooker, whilst he was still the Regis Professor of Botany at Glasgow University. The collection contains over 28,000 letters, newspaper clippings, specimen lists, expedition accounts and notes. Many of these letters have now been digitised and you can find these on the JSTOR Global Plants website. Finally, we'd like to mention a collection involved in one of our ongoing projects, the Miscellaneous Reports. This is one of the largest collections in our archive and comprises 772 volumes of letters and notes, administrative and scientific reports, photographs, specimens, drawings, newspaper cuttings and maps. Dating from 1850 to 1928, the collection documents the imperial role played by Kew Gardens at the centre of a network of botanic stations and gardens across the British Empire. Useful plants such as tea, coffee, tobacco, quinine and lime extract provided food, medicine, clothing and construction materials. The transportation and cultivation of these plants around the world were essential in growing Britain's global trading network. Kew provided botanical expertise to the government, information about the native uses of plants and the results of plant and agricultural experiments around the world. The content of this collection is being made available to researchers for the first time as a result of extensive conservation work and cataloguing generously supported by the Wellcome Trust. If you would like to further explore other materials which we hold in our archive, our archive catalogue is available for anyone to search and can be found through the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew website. Many of our collections are still being processed, so if you can't find what you need via our catalogue, do get in touch. We really hope this introduction to the Library, Art and Archives at Kew has sparked your interest. So why not come and visit us? Our reading room is open Monday to Friday, 10 to 4 p.m. We offer free access to our collections, Wi-Fi, a rotating free exhibition throughout the year, and friendly staff to help assist you with your visit. Academic or researcher, we welcome your ideas and would love to collaborate with you. We host and supervise several CDA PhD students and are keen to develop our emerging humanities research stream. Get in touch using the contact details at the end of the video. Please note that due to COVID-19, some of our usual services may not currently be available. Our reading room and with it the rotating exhibition we put on is closed to the public at the moment, although we hope to be able to open it again with reduced hours come January 2021. However, please do not hesitate to get in touch and we will do our best to assist you in your research. We are offering a scan on demand service for members of the public and are still able to help you advance your project for our inquiry services.